Hello, Sairam, everyone. My name is Jane Taylor. I'm the Pediatric Allergy and Respiratory Specialist Nurse, and I work here in Macclesfield um, in sunny, well, perhaps snowy Cheshire. Um, and I'm going to speak to you today about allergies and anaphylaxis in children. So as Cassandra was saying, it is a huge problem. We have about 1.5 million children who live in the northwest of England, and it's estimated that one in four or nearly 400,000 have allergic disease. This is a huge burden, not only for the families, but for the NHS as well. And it's interesting to note that the prevalence of food allergies seems to be increasing, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years and particularly in developed countries. And specifically studies in peanut allergy in the UK seems that children have been affected uh, by, and has doubled in the last few years. The other interesting thing to note is that immigration to allergy prevalent countries such as I in the UK causes more allergies and asthma in the immigrants as compared to the prevalence of ATP in their countries of origin. So it must be something that we are doing here that is causing this explosion of allergy. So let me go on to the classification of reactions to foods. So reactions to foods can be classified as immune or non-immune response. Within the immune response, this covers the immediate IgE-mediated response and the delayed non-IgE-mediated response. The non-immune response covers intolerances, and to certain enzymes in foods, and symptoms following ingestion of pharmacological enzymes. Some of these I'll go on to in a minute. So food allergy is the result of the immune system overreacting to a natural substance as such as a protein. And any food 
that contains a protein can cause the allergy. But luckily, the number of foods that cause severe allergy in children is quite small. They tend to be milk, egg, nuts, fish, and wheat. So let's go on to the immune response. So the IgE or immediate reaction is really easy to diagnose. It happens within minutes of having the protein that the child is allergic to. And the allergic symptoms occur each time that child is exposed to that protein. And the symptoms can cause things like, as you can see in the picture, swollen lips, urticaria, which is the nettle rash that you can see on the child's skin, and a number of other and possibly even more severe reactions. The non-IG mediated response is a delayed response, and this can be quite difficult to diagnose. It happens between 6, 8, 24 hours after ingestion of the protein. And symptoms can be those things that actually are of other things as well. So these can be eczema, colic, diarrhea, difficulty in feeding. So the only way we can diagnose the more delayed reactions is by removing the possible protein from the child's diet. And we do this for approximately six weeks to see if the symptoms improve. If they improve, we then should, and that's the gold standard, introduce the food back into the child's diet to see if the symptoms reoccur. Now, of course, many families, if the symptoms have gone, actually don't want to do that. Um, and I can quite understand why. But remember that a lot of the symptoms of the delayed allergy are all overlap with other conditions that children can suffer with, such as reflux. Going on to the non-IgE response, or this is the intolerances. So the intolerances are an inability for the, for the body to digest certain enzymes, such as lactose or gluten. Now, lactose is a sugar, and therefore, you have to have lactose-free things. And if the child has lactose-free milk but has a protein allergy, they will react. So lactose-free products wouldn't be suitable for them. It is still very important to have them, these intolerances investigated as, again, symptoms of these things such as the diarrhea, colic, discomfort, can be symptoms of other conditions. And also it's really important not to remove large food groups from the child's diet, as this can lead to deficiencies. Pharmacological enzymes can also cause a reaction in the child. And this can produce, for example, when you have antibiotics for a few days, a diarrhea, that kind of thing. There are a number of other allergies, of course, that we deal with. And some of these are what we call aeroallergens. And aeroallergens are things that you breathe in. So these things would be like grass pollen, tree pollen, causing hay fever, asthma, eczema, house dust mites. Everybody has house dust mites in their house, unfortunately, and we can't get rid of them. But if you're sensitized to it, then that can worsen your asthma, worsen your hay fever symptoms. We also deal with medication allergy, so drug allergy, such as penicillin allergy. Other things that you can breathe in are mold, especially if the house is damp or has, has damp in it. And that can also worsen things like asthma and eczema. Venom bites from wasps and bees in some people will cause an allergic reaction. Household chemicals can cause a reaction and latex. Latex tends to be in the adult, more in the adult population than it is in the children's population. But 90% of allergies are caused by milk, eggs, wheat, soya, peanuts, tree nuts, and fish. 
The first four, mostly children will lose their sensitivity to these by the school age. There are a few that keep it, but on the whole, the majority don't. The second three tend to be a lifelong problem. In the UK, we recognise 14 major food allergens. And as such, businesses must provide information regarding these. This would be if the, the food product is wrapped and on the ingredients list, these will be in bold. And this really is aiding the people who have problems with them to be able to see this immediately and be able to avoid that particular wrapped pro product. We run in Macclesfield a dedicated paediatric allergy service. It is headed by our consultant paediatrician who has an interest in allergy. He is supported by two of us, allergy asthma specialist nurses and paediatric dietitians. And we are very privileged to be part of the Northwest Allergy Paediatric Allergy Network. This is a group of clinicians working in allergy um, clinics across the Northwest. And we're dedicated to providing excellent care to the children and also providing information and, um, and, and, and also teaching about allergies. Conditions that are seen in our allergy clinic are not only food allergy, both delayed and immediate, but also things like hay fever, which can be really, really quite debilitating for children, eczema, asthma, urticaria, which is like the nettle rash, and drug allergy. So how do we diagnose a food allergy? Well, the main thing is to take what we call an allergy-focused history. This is really important to get into the actual minutiae of what happened when the child had that particular protein. It's a little bit like being a detective sometimes. I remember one day when we had a child that came to clinic and he had regular aller allergic reactions. We couldn't work out where, why this was happening. It wasn't anything to do with the child actually eating any food. But it always occurred with grandma. Now, grandma used to take the little boy to the play area every day. And as she walked to the play area, we later found out that in her handbag would be a little bag of chocolate Brazils. And the chocolate Brazils, she would surreptitiously dive into her handbag and pop one in her mouth. And then, because she's touched them with her hands, and she's eating them. When she cuddles and kisses the little boy, he develops an allergy, uh, an allergic reaction. And yes, you guessed it, he was allergic to Brazils. But it was took quite a bit of time to actually work that out. Now, once you have actually decided which allergen might be causing the problem, you then confirm it with tests. And the tests we have available are skin tests and blood tests. Now, for children, blood tests are a little bit invasive and not very nice for them. So we tend to go for skin tests, which are well, well um, received by children. And the way we do that is we put a little drop of the actual allergen onto the uh, arm, press it in with a slightly sharp stilette, and we wait for 15 minutes. And if we get a little bump, itchy bump, as in the picture, then we know that that is actually confirming that the, that child is um, allergic. We do have food challenges, which is the gold standard of what happens if the child has the um, food allergy, food um, protein. These are really for children who we're thinking, are they growing out of the, um, the allergy and could we reintroduce it back into the child's diet? And we do this by bringing them onto the ward. We give them a tiny amount incrementally increasing it over a period of time and checking them very carefully. Once we have established exactly what the child is allergic to, we then give advice regarding avoidance, where, to, um, where the pinch points are perhaps in schools, in uh, going out for eating and so on. We give dietary advice, particularly if it's a large food group that we are taking out of the child's diet to make sure that we don't um, cause them to have any deficiencies. 
and we give them rescue medication and teach them how to use that. So let's go on to how to recognize a mild or moderate allergic reaction. Often it will be, first of all, it is pretty immediate within minutes of having that particular protein. And they will develop perhaps hay fever type symptoms such as sneezing, runny, blocked nose, red, itchy, watery eyes, that kind of thing. A red, itchy rash, which is something like nettle rash, swelling of the lips and face. These can look really awful, like they've been in a boxing match. But if, as long as they're not impeding the breathing, it would still be mild to moderate allergic reaction. They might have worsening of their eczema symptoms, or they might have diarrhea and vomiting, particularly egg allergy, they often vomit. But how do we treat the mild allergic reaction? Well, if the child still has the food in its mouth, please remove it or uh, ask the child to spit it out. We give a non-sedating antihistamine such as loracidine or cetirizine. These are very readily available over the pharmacy counter. If they are under two, we will give them pyroton, which is a sedating type um, uh, antihistamine. We then watch for symptoms of a more severe reaction, and that would be anaphylaxis. The symptoms of anaphylaxis would be that the swelling that we were seeing of the lips and eyes, the swelling's happening internally, causing swelling around the voice box, around the airways, and causing swelling of the tongue. This can cause problems with breathing and with swallowing. So the child may get a persistent, what we call a persistent staccato cough. So, it's <coughs> so something's at the back of the child's throat. A hoarse or husky voice, difficulty in swallowing. Sometimes they drool because they can't get the, um, the saliva down. A swollen tongue, wheezy or noisy breathing or difficulty in breathing. Going on to dizziness or wooziness or not quite with it, faint and collapse. This is anaphylaxis. It is a severe and potentially fatal allergic reaction. And it develops really suddenly after being exposed to that food and gets worse very quickly. And a severe anaphylactic reaction is known as anaphylactic shock. So this is a child that is, been, is allergic to peanut and has been exposed to peanut. And this is two to three minutes later. So very, very quickly. She's already getting swelling around her eyes. She's already getting itching and she's complaining of feeling unwell. You can see her clutching her stomach at that point. Within five minutes, five minutes of eating that product with peanut in, she is already coughing and wheezing, showing signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis. I'm pleased to report this child was perfectly all right. She, she got the treatment she required, required and she recovered very quickly. So what do you do if you suspect anaphylaxis? It is a medical allergy, uh, emergency. If they are feeling woozy or dizzy, you lie them flat with their legs raised. This makes sure that the, 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 their vital organs have got, have, are fused. Or you sit them upright if they are having difficulty in breathing. Whatever you do, you never let them stand up because if they stand up, their blood pressure can drop and they might actually collapse. You administer the adrenaline auto injector if you have one available. And you do this without delay. If you're humming and hiring, should I, shouldn't I? You do. It's not going to do them any harm, but it will harm them if you, if you delay. Call 999 and state anaphylaxis. If the symptoms do not improve after five minutes, then you give the second adrenaline auto injector in the other leg if you have it available. If the child is asthmatic and has salbutamol blue inhaler available, you start giving them that 10 puffs of that and then one puff every minute until that ambulance arrives. Of course, the main thing is we want to prevent that happening in the first place. So once the trigger is identified, then the parents and carers can ensure that the child is not exposed to that. If the child is at risk of, a, of anaphylaxis, then we would ask them to carry two adrenaline auto injectors at all times. 
all children who have an, a food allergy should carry all oral antihistamine. And if appropriate and may have asthma, should carry their blue asthma inhaler. They should all carry an up-to-date management plan and they should be able to, or their carers and parents should all be able to administer an injection if anaphylaxis is suspected. And anaphylaxis and adrenaline auto injector training should be given to the parents, carers, schools, nurseries every year. Adrenaline works really quickly to reverse the symptoms of anaphylactic reaction. And it's given intramuscular, so it must go into muscle. And it's given in the front of the upper thigh, so the outer aspect of the thigh. And it's the drug of choice. We use single-use adrenaline auto-injectors. And each auto-injector injects as pre-measured single dose appropriate for that child. In the UK, we have two different types available, Jex pen and EpiPens, and both of them come in different strengths according to the child's weight. We also have available to give the parents an allergy action plan. The allergy action plan is to facilitate first aid treatment for anaphylaxis and for treating allergy symptoms for people who have no medical training. They are medical documents and they should be completed by a child's health professional. We have available, if your child does have an EpiPen or a Jex pen, uh, websites where you can go on for training videos and making sure that you understand how to give that, that um, adrenaline auto injector. And there are quite a lot of useful websites, quite a lot of unuseful websites as well on the, the net, but useful websites such as our own Allergy Northwest, Anaphylaxis UK and Allergy UK. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the sort of quick run through on allergy. Um, we are going to save questions to the end and I am going to hand over to Dr. Kadanram to um, go on for um, with the next talk. Thank you. Right. Okay. Thank you, Jen. She's done a um, brilliant job by talking about food allergies. So I'm going to talk about allergies in others, mainly focusing on allergic rhinitis and asthma. So seasonal allergic rhinitis is also called as hay fever. Um, so what is allergic rhinitis? Um, it is your immune system reaction to common allergens. Um, uh, what happens is that the exposure to an allergen uh, triggers a certain immune system reaction, which causes um, a type of cell called IgE and mast cells to be released. They work on the, the mucosa, so the soft tissues around the nose, around the sinuses, causes swelling of those areas and leads to increased secretion, which leads to the symptoms of allergic rhinitis. Common allergens, um, again, it's similar to uh, what Jane touched on in children. The common allergens are house dust mite, pollen. So you see a, a hay fever uh, during the spring season when, when the pollen count, count is very, very high. Dander, moss, uh, and cat and cat and dog are most common allergens as well. Um, so this slide talks about symptoms of allergic rhinitis. Uh, it does vary from person to person and depends on the immune system response. Um, the immune system response, um, the severity of the immune system response can vary. And so the symptoms can vary too. Um, headache, uh, is, uh, which is a heavy headedness. And that's again due to congestion in the sinuses. So sinuses are small holes which clears up the secretion. And what can happen is uh, in allergic rhinitis is they, they uh, get filled with secretion, they get swollen, and that causes a headache. Um, snoring, um, the snoring is due to uh, blockage of nose with the secretions. So uh, they tend, uh, um, people tend to uh, breathe using their mouth instead of, instead of the nose, and that leads to the snoring. 
ear pain uh, and the itching in the ear is due to increased amount of secretion mainly in the middle ear uh, and the ear canal um, that's blocking the uh, hear, blocking the ear and causing hearing loss. Uh, sore throat uh, due to immune system response is in the in the throat. Um, itchy eyes and conjunctivitis. So the conjunctivitis that you get is allergic conjunctivitis. So that can cause a clear discharge, so watery discharge. So this is non-infectious uh, and patients don't need antibiotics. So there's, there's a common misconception within conjunctivitis, you need antibiotics, but with allergic conjunctivitis, uh, you don't need antibiotics. Um, and also it causes sneezing uh, and nasal discharge. So this leads, leads to um, complications of allergic rhinitis. The most common, three most common complications of allergic rhinitis are nasal polyps, which are small lumps in the nose, uh, which, which are non-cancerous benign lumps, but they block the breathing, they block the nose, and that was further worsens the symptoms. Uh, sinusitis, so sinusitis can be Acute or chronic, so acute meaning that happens um, short term. Chronic means it uh, means it lasts on for more than twelve weeks. Uh, that again is due to um, increased secretion in the sinuses due to the immune system response uh, and swelling of the sinuses as well. Uh, middle ear infections again, as I said earlier, uh, there's lots of secretions in the middle ear, uh, and because there are secretions, that's it's a good place for uh, bacteria to grow and that leads to middle ear infections. Um, this slide um, shows what allergic rhinitis and acute sinusitis. Um, um, so um, it's a pictorial diagram. So on the, on the left-hand side, um, these are the um, signs of allergic rhinitis. On the right-hand side is acute sinusitis. So as you can see on the allergic rhinitis side, it's all clear content. So it's non-inflamed, um, um, non-infectious symptoms. Uh, whereas on the right side with sinusitis, um, it's inflammation uh, initially, and also it can cause infection as well. So um, the discharge is more prune and pussy discharge, whereas in, in rhinitis, you get clear watery discharge. So what can you do as a, uh, before you even go and see the GP, you know, things that you can do to help yourself? First of all, the most common uh, thing is the antihistamine tablet over the counter. Um, loratadine and cetirizine are the most common ones. Loratadine, uh, loratadine would be more, more preferred as it's less drowsy compared to cetirizine, but both of them are equally good. Um, Nilmet sinus rinse. So Nilmet sinus rinse is basically a salty water solution. Um, so it's made up, you can, you can buy without a prescription from, from any um, pharmacy. Um, and what it does, it clears up the nasal passages it clears up the nostril and the, and the tube that goes from the nostril to the sinuses uh, and um, reduces down the symptom. Salt water gargling also has similar effect. Also, allergens can be completely avoided because it's, most of these are aeroallergens. It's reducing the exposure to allergen, especially during the pollen season, will also reduce the symptoms of allergic rhinitis. Um, so when to see a GP? Um, so if the if the symptoms are disrupting sleep, if it's preventing you carrying out everyday activities, um, adversely affecting performance at work or school, then you should go and see a GP. And if we've tried all the previous measures I spoke about, and if there's no improvement at all, and then then to see a GP too. Or if you got red flag symptoms, these are the symptoms to look out for. And these are symptoms, which means that it's not allergic rhinitis and it's something else. Uh, um, so the main symptoms we look out for is unilateral nasal pain. So pain to one nostril rather than both the nostrils. Um, discharge coming out of just one nostril. Bloody discharge, so any kind of blood coming out of one nostril. If you got nose block, but nose block to just one nostril rather than affecting both the nostrils. If it's, if it's a nose block to one nostril, it could mean that there is a polyp in that nostril rather than both the nostril. And that is again a red flag symptom. And that, mean, that means it's not, it's not a complication of allergy rhinitis. It's a different problem that needs uh, um, more investigation by a GP, uh, perhaps referral to a specialist. Um, 
So what can the GP do if it's allergic rhinitis? The first most common thing is a steroid nasal spray. So these reduces down the inflammation in the nasal passages as well as the sinuses. Uh, the key to it is actually using it long term. It needs to be used for a minimum of eight weeks to notice any improvement. So it's not a short term solution, it's more of a long term solution. Um, um, the GP can um, arrange for allergy testing. Most commonly in others, allergy testing is done as a blood test. So it looks for specific IgE, which is part of the immune system against a specific allergen. And, and the testing will be done against the common allergens that I spoke about earlier. We can use a combination of a steroid and an antihistamine nasal spray. There's a combined nasal spray called Dimista. Uh, Dimista um, actually works by reducing down inflammation and but also works on the mast cells, uh, which is part of the immune system. So it dampens down the mast cell. Uh, but right, and, and combining both those effects, it, it gives a greater relief. Um, GP can diagnose complications of allergy rhinitis, uh, refer to the specialist if persistent symptoms are present or if any of the red flag symptoms are present uh, as I spoke earlier. Um, what can the specialist do for um, allergy rhinitis? So it's immunotherapy treatment, which is kind of more on the trend uh, and it does work very well. Immunotherapy treatment basically means exposing the patient to the allergen that they are allergic to in a graded way. A small amount of the allergen is given either subcutaneously, subcutaneously meaning under the skin, or sublingually, which is under the tongue. And initially, it will be given every weekly, and when one stabilizes every four to six weekly injection for maximum three years. And this is the only treatment that can reduce the prognosis, improve the prognosis and prevent the patient from getting um, allergy rhinitis. It doesn't work for everyone, but um, it is it, something that can be tried on. Um, the adverse effects are mild and short lived. The adverse effects that you get with the immunotherapy treatment uh, is um, itching of the nostrils, crusting, um, symptoms of allergic rhinitis, a sneezing, rhinorrhea, um, but they all are short-lived and thus do get improved. Uh, so moving on from allergic rhinitis to asthma, so again, both of them are in a spectrum. So, I'll, but most patients with allergic rhinitis uh, do have asthma or can go on to develop asthma. It is a very, very common condition. 5.4 million people uh, receive treatment for asthma in the UK. That is, that is one in 11 children and one in 12 adults. Um, it is an inflammatory condition. So it is swelling of the airways, the pipe that goes down to the lungs. Um, when you see paroxysmal paroxys and reversible obstruction, so it, it comes and goes and it is reversible with medication. Um, so symptoms can be fairly very well controlled. Um, also, asthma has a low mortality in young adults, so it doesn't, it doesn't cause uh, higher amounts of deaths in young adults. It's associated with a lot of mobility, so that's time of work, time of school, um, symptoms that's not well controlled and high risk of mortality uh, in elderly. So mortality means high risk of death in the elderly. So risk factors for asthma. If you have a personal history of atopy, so if you either have eczema or hay fever type symptoms, allergic rhinitis, food allergies, then you are more at risk of developing asthma. Family history of asthma or atopy. Uh, if you live in an inner city environment, so inner city environment is to do is to do, is, is to do with pollution and dust that increases the um, um, risk for asthma. Um, Social economic deprivation. Social economic deprivation can mean again in living in an inner city environment with lots of pollution, high risk of smoking, high risk of maternal smoking, paternal smoking, 
smoking in the house, those all increase the risk. Uh, obesity, being born premature, uh, being born premature, the lungs haven't had time to mature, uh, and um, and that does increase the risk of asthma later down in life. Um, viral infections in the early childhood, so recurrent infections, which kind of causes um, inflammation to the lower part of the uh, um, airways, uh, increases the risk of asthma. Smoking, so smoking as an adult or um, being in an environment where other people smoke. And early exposure to broad spectrum antibiotics. So that's interesting because um, um, with children or that's going into um, a doctor with any kind of symptoms, there's a, there's a expectation that antibiotics can help, but it has to be selectively chosen and increasing use of broad spectrum antibodies. So antibiotics that's given, which works, uh, which kills off most of the bacteria, uh, can increase the risk of asthma. So uh, features that increase the probability of asthma. Um, so if there's more than one of the symptoms that I've written down, so if, you, if you've been having breathing difficulty, wheeze, chest tightness, or a history of atopic disorder, uh, that does increase the probability of asthma. If there's a family history of asthma, um, if you do go into the GP and there's widespread wheeze, um, and if or if recurrent infections, viral infections, uh, then we do think about asthma, whether there's a possibility of asthma. Um, unexplained peripheral blood eosinophilia. So eosinophil is part of the immune system, which can be uh, detected on a blood test. Uh, and they get released in response to an allergen. Uh, and if there is an raised eosinophils in the absence of no other reasons for it, then we need to think about asthma. So um, investigations wise, um, the simple test that can be done in the GP surgery is a peak flow test. So a peak flow meter uh, is one I've shown in the, foot, uh, the picture next to it. So basically what you would be expected to do is um, take a deep breath and then blow with full force into the peak flow meter. Uh, and then uh, we expect to keep a diary for a month. Uh, and this will be compared against um, predicted and the best peak flow reading for the age, gender, and um, sex. Um, and we would also be checking for reversibility. So reversibility, when I mean reversibility, giving a medication to open up the airways uh, and see whether that improves the peak flow. So it would be done pre-medication and post-medication uh, and a diary to, to keep to see whether that improves the symptom. Spirometry is preferred uh, over peak flow. It's more of, a, um, more of an accurate test that can be done, uh, most, mostly can be done in most GP surgeries. Um, this is where you go in and blow into a small machine. Uh, it works out the lung capacity. Uh, unfortunately, due to the coronavirus pandemic, this is not uh, this is not possible uh, because spirometry is something called an aerosol generating procedure. So uh, it does release um, secretions, um, 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 and so it does increase the risk of um, coronavirus. Um, if the patient have a have coronavirus, it does increase the risk of the staff catching it. And so it's not done during the pandemic, but hopefully once this is all over, this will all be resumed again. Um, so um, going on to the treatment of asthma, I've divided into um, on the left-hand side is reliever and, and on the middle and the right-hand side is the preventer. There are many, many different types of inhalers and colors of inhaler, but I've just taken the uh, the three to uh, distinguish between them. So on the, the most right-hand side is the brown one, which is something called the clenil. So clenil is a steroid uh, medication. So that does dam uh, that reduces down the swelling, the inflammation of the pipe that goes down to the lungs. Um, on the middle is something called a first air, which is a combination inhaler. So first air has a steroid, and another medication which opens up the airways, uh, the smaller airways, and keeps the airway open for longer, and that improves the oxygen um, supply. The important thing with the preventer is to use it regularly. 
in asthma. So no matter how you feel, even if you feel completely well, um, the important thing is to use the preventer as prescribed uh, and regularly. The idea behind is to reduce asthma flare-ups and hospital admissions. If the condition is well controlled with the preventer, um, uh, it reduces the risk of hospital admission and the flare-ups. Um, and also it reduces the need for use of reliever. So a well-controlled asthma patient is someone who uses a reliever for less than three times a week. So reliever is uh, mentholin, which is the most common one, salbutamol. It's a medicine which opens up the airway, um, but it only opens up the airway and keep it open for a short period. Um, so it's a short acting medication. It, so it rapidly relieves the symptoms. So patients find that when they take the blue inhaler, the symptoms are you know, better almost immediately, whereas the preventer, it doesn't work that immediately and they, they don't see a point in using it. But the idea of the preventer is to reduce the use of the reliever and prevent hospital admission. The reliever medication doesn't prevent you from getting into hospital and being admitted with an asthma attack, whereas the preventers do. So that's where the, 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 the line lies. And if you are using the reliever medication for more than three times a week, then that's time for you to speak to the GP which, uh, which means that means that the asthma is not well controlled and the GP, uh, the specialist nurse in the, GP, in the GP surgery or your GP needs to look at your preventive medication and adjust them to control, improve the symptoms. So in an acute asthma, when you, that's when you have a flare up, when to see a GP. So is, that's when um, symptoms are worsening. Uh, if you have a productive cough, especially productive cough with, uh, with green phlegm, or if the peak expiratory flow rate is 50 to 70%, 75% of best or predicted. Uh, and then when to call an ambulance. And so uh, the, the time to call an ambulance is if you're struggling to speak in full sentences, any kind of chest pain, rapid breathing and feeling exhausted, uh, peak expiratory flow rate of less than 50%, that's time to call an ambulance. And what will happen either in the ambulance or, give, or in hospital. Um, so you'll be given a nebulized therapy. So it's similar medications, which is in the inhaler, so the medicine to open up the airways, but given at a higher dose uh, and works longer. Um, asthma can drop down the oxygen uh, levels or an oxygen uh, to improve the oxygen. IV steroids, so IV medication, medication given through the drip uh, to reduce down the inflammation rapidly. Uh, and there are a couple of other intravenous medication that can also be given if these things are not working. Um, in children, IV salbutamol is given, so medicine to open up the airway through the drip. In adults, we use IV magnesium, uh, and that's, uh, those are all treatments that's, that can be given uh, in hospital if you um, end up needing, needing to go into the hospital. So what should you expect from, a G, from your GP on an annual basis? What should the GP do? Um, so annual review of symptomatic control. So this is three point question that needs to be asked. Whether asthma is disrupting the sleep, whether it's affecting activities, um, whether it's um, interfering with day-to-day -day activities, or whether it's reducing the exercise tolerance. Um, and they would also, in a, in, a, in a normal setting, will do a spirometry on an annual basis. Um, review of exacerbations in the previous year, use of any kind of steroids, and time of work or school. Um, make sure the inhaler technique is accurate uh, and do it again. Um, make sure the patient is using the medication in the, in the right way uh, and adhering to them. Uh, and also, um, checking whether the patient has got an asthma plan and is whether it's up to date and whether that's being followed up. Um, these are a few of the useful resources that can be checked. Um, so it um, resources to look at asthma as well as hay fever type symptoms. Uh, it does give you a lot more information than what I could cover through in this uh, short 20 minutes presentation. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'll now pass on to 
Mr. Guru Dutt Sisodia, who is an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, Uh, thanks uh, very much, Dr. Uh, uh, Sundaram, and to uh, Jane for those really uh, informative talks. Um, I think uh, just hearing about allergies, food allergies and asthma and rhinitis, it's uh, something that most of us have um, probably first-hand experience of, or at least of uh, relatives or friends with, with that. And certainly my, I have two children, both with food allergies, so I found that really interesting. So thanks. Thanks very much. Um, uh, if you're feeling up to we'll go straight into some questions, please, that have been submitted already. Uh, so the first question I'd like to put to Jane, please. Um, and that is, um, can food allergies be prevented from developing in the first place? Uh, and if so, how? Hi, yes. Um, so that's a really interesting question and uh, wouldn't that be really great? But um, so there is some new studies coming out. Um, and one of the reasons why we're thinking that there's been such an explosion of allergies in our society is that we've actually not given the children things like nuts is, at a young age. So um, the recent studies in the recent years what is coming out is that we should actually be giving our children these foodstuffs that before we were thinking don't give them. Because what we're doing by delaying introduction of things like nuts in a child's diet is that we might be setting them up for an, an allergic reaction. So, um, so is there a way to prevent it? If you have a history of allergy um, in your family, so another child has got a food allergy, and you have a new child comes along on the scene, then it is very a good idea to speak to your doctor or your health sister regarding how early you should introduce these things. And it, it, it appears from the studies, um, and, and they are really robust studies, that we should be actually putting it in really early on in life. And so that's the way to prevent it. Okay, that's, that's really helpful. I think that um, the next follow-up question really... I think you may well have answered, but it, it was basically what age should we introduce nuts to our children's diet? As early as possible is a message, is that is that correct? Early as possible, and there are now products available that um, contain peanut that are suitable for young children. There's a product called Bamba, B-A-M-B-A. This is like a almost like a, a what's it? So, um, so it's but so it's very soft, um, able for the very young children to have. Contains peanut, um, and that's a good way of using um, introducing peanut into the diet. Obviously, there's things like peanut butter as well, but that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question is for uh, Dr. Shanmugasundaram. Um, what's the difference? And I think we may have covered this to a degree, but just to summarise, uh, what's the difference between an allergy, a sensitivity, and an intolerance, and and why does it matter? Right. Uh, so allergy is um, Ig immediate response, so that's an immune system response. Whereas whereas intolerance is most uh, mostly a non Ig mediated, so non immune cell response. Um, why does it matter? Uh, it matters because the severity of the symptoms do differ and the treatments do, um, can, uh, can differ as well. So that, that's why it matters. So um, cow's milk protein intolerance, rather than it's not, it's not an allergy, it's more of an intolerance, whereas you can have um, a lactose intolerance, a food intolerance, um, and allergy, so allergic rhinitis is more of an allergy, so it's exposure to allergens that causes it. So in intolerance, um, just removing the substance, and it's easy to remove them, can improve the symptoms and gradually can be um, restarted. Re, um, uh, and the patients are more likely to um, tolerate it better compared to the allergy side of things. So more patients are less likely to tolerate it. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Jane, uh, please. Uh, can, again, I think we may have covered it to a degree, but um, can allergies be cured by giving small amounts of that particular food allergen? Okay, so that, that also is a really interesting and, and um, question because um, can they be cured? No, they can never be actually cured. So you can get some toleration 
but you're never actually cured of that. Um, so obviously children do grow out of things like milk and egg allergy, but things like peanut allergy and fish allergy, can that be cured? Well, at the moment, we are um, there are studies going ahead giving small amounts of peanut um, in very, very um, uh, supervised way of trying to get the children to tolerate the peanut and an amount of peanut. Now, this is, um, this is desensitization, a bit like as we were discussing about the um, desensitization for pollen. It is only done in certain children. It is only done privately and it's or it's under studies at the moment. So it's not available on the NHS. But just to be absolutely clear, this is not a cure. It's not a cure at all. It is just um, trying to get the child to be able to tolerate it. And of course, then throughout their life, they're going to have to have that in their diet, small amount to keep that toleration up. Because as soon as you stop doing that, the toleration will go because you've still got that allergy potentially to cause problems. Right. And so you mentioned peanuts uh, as a desensitization therapy might be available privately. Is is that, to your knowledge, is that the only one that might be available? Are there other uh, programs for different foods privately available? Yeah. The, so um, peanut is the, the main one at the moment uh, that is undergoing many, many studies, some in the Northwest here, um, some um, mostly in Cambridge and in Southampton, big area for allergy. Um, but also um, some areas, and they tend to be what we call tertiary centres, which is the big, the big uh, university hospitals, might do some um, milk um, desensitisation as well for those children who keep on with their milk allergy uh, in later on in childhood. Um, it is not available, um, you know, very widely, and, um, and a lot of it is under more study rather than actually uh, available for any, you know, even privately. So uh, it is it is very few centres at the moment, but maybe one day we're hoping. Let's hope so. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Shan Mugasundaram, uh, we've heard that steroid nasal sprays are a common treatment for some allergies. Uh, but are there any long-term side effects of these steroid sprays, please? Yeah, um, long-term side effects are rare, um, extremely rare. And with allergic rhinitis, a long-term treatment of steroids is needed. So it's, it is said that it's safe to use those uh, steroid sprays for years even. Um, most commonly with long-term side effects, um, it's a localized reaction to the, uh, the steroid. So you can have crusting of the nostrils where it's used, um, increase uh, mucosa discharge. Um, it's a rebound reaction that can happen. Very, very rarely, uh, long-term steroid use can cause cataract, but it's extremely rare and the benefits outweigh the risk. Uh, and so therefore, it's said it is safe to use them long-term. Okay. Uh, that's good to know. Uh, the next question is actually more of a, a request for any general advice, please, for food allergy sufferers when they go out for meals or order takeaways. Uh, Jane, probably one for you, please. Okay, yeah, so absolutely. Um, it's really tricky going out to eat and, um, and having takeaways um, when you have a food allergy. So um, our advice is that you in, always ensure that you inform the, um, the restaurant or takeaway that you have the food allergy every single time. And that's, um, so, so sometimes people will say, well, we've been there, we go there every week. It's fine, you know, they know us. But that day that they go, it's a different chef in this restaurant and they don't understand it. And that's the day that things happen and things get put in to the, um, the food. So it is important to say every time that you have that allergy and ensure that you check that those, um, those dishes that you're having are free of that allergen. The other thing I always suggest, which I think is a, quite a good sort of fail-safe thing, is when the waiter comes and takes your order, ask them to write it down on the order slip. That ensures that that order slip is seen by the chef. The problem is that in a busy kitchen, 
the waitress doesn't or the waiter doesn't ever doesn't necessarily speak to the um, the chef, but the chef will actually see this ticket. So ensure that you inform that restaurant and that takeaway. Now, takeaways, unfortunately, are the, the biggest problem that we have. And that's because you're taking the food away, you're not in the restaurant. Sometimes there's not the ownership of being so careful and there's cross-contamination. And that's the biggest problem of cross-contamination. So um, be careful with takeaways, uh, be careful with restaurants. But the biggest thing is be careful with buffets. Buffets are dreadful because you have all these dishes and people are just use the same spoon for the one with peanut in as the one that it hasn't got peanut in. And so it all gets all mixed up and then that can be a problem as well. That's some uh, really sensible advice. I'm making notes here for sure. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. Um, the next one, next question is, is quite specific. And again, Jane, I think uh, I'd ask your thoughts, please, on uh, the question asks, why do I get uh, a tingly, itchy tongue when I eat fresh apples? Am I allergic to them? Okay, that, that's also an interesting and probably a lot of people are saying, actually, that's what I get when I eat such and such. So this is what is um, what we call is um, oral allergy syndrome or food pollen syndrome. And this is all to do with the fact that you're actually allergic to pollen. And it's a bit of a mad thing, but actually what's happening when you eat that fruit is that the body is recognizing the fruit as pollen. And so you're having a big bite of pollen. And of course, that means that it all gets a bit tingly and a bit itchy. Once you swallow it and the gastric juices work on that food, then the body doesn't recognize it as pollen anymore. So therefore, that it, it, all, that it doesn't go on to any more symptoms. So oral allergy syndrome, it's almost always to fresh fruit. It's always to do with the fact that you are also allergic to pollens. Madly, I know, but that's the way it is. And if you cook that fruit or you tin that fruit and there, there it changes it so the body doesn't recognize it as pollen anymore. So oral allergy syndrome, very, very common, um, but it doesn't go on to being a proper allergy. Again, very useful information. That. So you could uh, and, uh, perhaps wash the fruit more thoroughly and see if you have a, rea a reaction still. That solved the problem. No, nope, no, nope. washing it wouldn't make any problem any difference if it's fresh fruit it will be it'll be uh, you know you're not changing anything by just washing it you have to right. cook it tin right. it jam it whatever okay. by changing it by cooking it you're changing it anything anything raw you're not changing it enough so your body is going to just recognize it as pollen and think, what, what are you eating? Pollen for? That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> when you put it like that, yeah, I agree. Um, okay, Dr. Shan Shanmugasundaram, uh, if I could ask you the next one. Um, if someone wants to have a serious reaction or anaphylaxis, is it still safe to come into hospital given the current COVID pandemic? Of course, yeah, yeah, definitely. It is safe to come in uh, into the hospital. Um, as uh, you know, Jane mentioned in this presentation, if they have a serious anaphylactic reaction, if they've had it before, and if they do have an adrenaline injector, they inject it uh, and call ambulance and say anaphylaxis, and they should be seen immediately. It is a life-threatening emergency, uh, and um, th that needs to be dealt by the accident emergency doctors. Um, and not coming into the hospital can potentially cause death. So, yeah, no matter what the coronavirus pandemic is, emergency services are 24-7, it's running throughout, and they should come into the hospital regardless. That's, uh, that's great advice. Thank you. So I think that concludes our question and answer session uh, this evening. Um, uh, so before before we finish, I'd like to thank uh, Bhagwan Shisati Sai Baba for providing this opportunity and this platform that's allowed us to reach each other and learn from one another. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say a huge thank you to our guest speakers, uh, Jane Taylor and Dr. Shanmuga Sundaram, for really taking considerable time and effort in putting together uh, their talks and presentations. Uh, you know, I've definitely learned something new today, and I'm sure many of us have. Um, I didn't quite realize how common allergies are and that uh, uh, you know people from different different uh, countries have emigrated to the UK have 
a much higher rate than uh, than their home country. So uh, really interesting stuff with some really clear, practical advice. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'd like to also thank all the viewers and listening and listeners who've taken the time to join us this evening and also for submitting uh, your questions. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Vasanthi Anti for her introductions today and also for her help with making arrangements uh, leading up to the webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, last but certainly not least, a huge thank you to those behind the scenes, uh, Sister Gayatri for her unwavering commitments to organising these webinars. Uh, Tushar and the media team for their expertise and Dr. Upadhyay for his oversight. Thank you all so much. Um, and that just leaves me to invite you all to the next health webinar on Tuesday the 4th of May, uh, again between 8 and 9 p.m. at the same website uh, when the topic will be eye conditions.